off. Those of you on vacation, I know a lot of people vacation this time of year, but we are going to do the normal as I usually do here in BWC. Have this next hour, we're going to take half of this time to go into some personal development stuff, another half to go into some professional development stuff. And what I'm going to do before I even uh, introduce myself fully, I'm going to present two topics here. And for the first 30 minutes, we're going to you're going to vote on these topics in the comment section here in uh, Clubhouse. First of all, before we even get to that, please make sure you share this room. So at the bottom of your screen, when you're looking at the Clubhouse app, there is a little share icon. All of you know what it looks like. It's the same icon in every social media app. Click that little icon. It's next to the comments. So the comment says 286 right next to that is the share icon. Click that, tap that, and share this room. I don't care if you share it on a, another social media app. If you send a text message to a friend, if you just share on Clubhouse, but just share this room right now, everybody who is in here so that we can let other people know what is going on here at BWC. We want to share the wealth, let other people know that we are sharing things in here that are helping people grow, help people get better to develop themselves personally and develop themselves professionally. So please share out the room as you are uh, listening to me right now. Now, what I'm going to do is introduce, I'm going to share two topics here on the personal development side and you are going to vote in the comments as to which one I should spend this first 30 minutes addressing. I will do that, whichever one wins. Then we'll take a few comments on that one. Then we're going to do the same thing again at the bottom of the hour at around 8.30. I'm going to introduce two uh, professional development, entrepreneurship, business uh, focused topics. Y'all going to vote on that and I'll do the same thing. Well, I'll go through the topic and then we'll take some comments and then my time will be up. Does that all sound good? Any questions? Great. All right. So let's get to it. Let's see what two topics I want to throw out here today that we can go into. And again, one of the things about these two these two topics, whether it's personal or professional development, is that you can apply the personal stuff to your business life. You can apply the business stuff to your personal life as well. The, the uh, versatility of these topics is the best part about it. So two topics here. One will be how to respond and not react that's one option and the other one is how to increase your stress tolerance so respond and not react put the letter r in the chat if you want me to talk about how to respond and not react or if you rather me talk about how to increase your tolerance for stress put the letter s in the chat if i should talk about increasing your stress tolerance. So R is respond, not react. And S is increasing your tolerance for stress. Now, while you all are voting and just vote in the comment section, just put an R or S in the chat and let me know which one else to talk about. While you're voting, let me introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dre Baldwin. Many know me as Dre all day. I'm a former nine-year professional athlete, author of 33 books. And I'm four TED Talks, created this whole brand called Work On Your Game. But what we do here is really simple. We take the tools, the mental and strategic tools to help athletes get to the top 1% in the sports world. We translate those tools over to the business world so professionals like yourselves perform at your highest level, do so consistently, and as a result, you're going to make more money. So that's what we do here at Work On Your Game. We do personal and professional development. We focus on mindset, which is the foundation of all success. is also the foundation of failure. The strategy, which is the game plan of what you're going to do. The system, which is how do we operate that game plan over and over again. And then the accountability. Make sure that both the plan and the person are doing what they're supposed to do on a consistent basis. That is the framework for how working your game works. Now let's see what's going on in the comment section. I think we got a good amount of uh, votes here. And let's see. So we got some R's. We got some... Our journey said you need both of these... I know. <laughs> so if you listen to the Work On Your Game podcast, which is that my solo podcast comes out every day, I've talked about these topics. So if any topic that I don't get to because it doesn't win the vote, there is material on this topic. You might just not get it here at BWC because, you know, majority rules. So we got a, we got a democracy here in the comments. So we got R's. We got a lot of strong R's. The S's come in and R's. I'm just eyeballing this just to see. It looks like the R's are winning very strongly. And Khalil, I see you there in the comments. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know what Khalil is referring to, is my daily motivation text, which I send out every single day for free. So any of you want to get that text, you can text me at the number that I just put in the chat. <clears throat> any of you want to get that daily motivation. So the R is winning, which means how to respond and not react. That is the topic we'll talk about here. And we'll, again, we'll take the first half of this segment to discuss that. And then we'll get into some professional development stuff 
And as I said, you can apply these in either way, no matter what they are. So usually when we react to things, that means we are not allowing a space in between the stimulus and whatever we do about the stimulus, usually called the response. And we are also often when we are reacting when we're in reactive mode, we are allowing our emotions to dictate our activities. Now, while there are times in life when it does make sense to react, for example, if you're walking home late at night in a dark street and a, a rabid dog is foaming at the mouth, is chasing you, you should probably react. Uh, you probably shouldn't think about that. You probably shouldn't Google what to do. You should probably just react and run. Or if you're, if you're in the gym and somebody throws a basketball at your face, you probably should, should just duck instead of considering your options and you know, deciding or asking the audience what they think. You probably should duck before you get hit in the face with the ball. So there are times when you should react. However, many times in life, we are better off responding and putting some space in between what happens and what we do. For example, any of you who goes to the, you go to a doctor and the doctor gives you some type of medicine or your physician is doing some type of treatment for you based on some ailment that you could possibly have, or maybe they think you have. And the treatment is causing, is making the situation worse. Maybe you're, you're having some kind of breakout. Maybe you're allergic, whatever. And the situation is really not getting better. What does the doctor say? The doctor says, oh, well, it looks like your body is reacting to the treatment. Your body is reacting to this medicine. Your body is reacting to this uh, new organ that we're trying to install into your system. A reaction is a bad thing. The doctor says your body is reacting. That's not good. Doesn't want you to do that. Doesn't want that to happen. But if the doctor gives you some treatment, some medicine or some you no know, placebo sugar pills, and you seem to be getting better, what does the doctor say? The doctor says, oh, well, good news. Your body is responding to the treatment. So this is exactly what we want to do. We don't want to be reacting. We want to be responding. So let's get into here what I have. One, two, three points on how to respond and not react. Number one, emotional control. Understand that emotions are part of us being human. It's part of the human condition that we have emotions. So I'm not telling you to not have emotions, but we have to keep in mind that emotions cause reactions. We don't react when we're in a more of a uh, responsive state. We react when we're in an emotional state and all humans have emotions. That's why we all need to be in what I call the emotional management business. We all need to learn how to manage our emotions. We're not always going to be able to stop them from you know, feeling how they feel or uh, triggering as they can be triggered. And we all have different things that trigger us, but we do need to learn how to control and manage our emotions. So since we all have them, we all have to learn how to direct them where we want them to go when we recognize them and without them telling us where to go. Right? You don't want your emotions telling you where to go. You want to be telling your emotions where to go. As I like to say, emotions are great gas pedals, but terrible steering wheels. All right? it, what you want to do with your emotions is decide what direction you want to go, how you want to use them. Then you allow the emotion to step on the gas and press you forward in whatever direction you have chosen with your rational thinking and logic where you want to go. But if you ever let your emotions grab the steering wheel of your life, they, you can end up a crash test dummy. So any of you remember the commercials from back in the day, the crash test dummies, they were really talking about drunk driving. But if you really think about it, when you're emotional and you're allowing your emotions to control the situation, you are pretty much in the same state as the drunk driver. You become that crash test dummy. You might get run into a wall simply because Emotions don't think logically. They just react immediately, kind of like in like a dog or something. They immediately react. They don't have time to think. And this is what puts humans above animals, that we have the ability to think, to rationalize, to see around corners, to look back into the past, to look forward into the future. Animals don't have that ability. We do. So we need to use it. So since we all have emotions, again, we have to control. Them. Now, recognize, accept and appreciate your emotions when you feel them. Recognize them for what they are. Recognize that they're there but do not allow them to dictate your behavior. So take them into account the same way you would take into account those of you who run businesses, you have people who work for you, or those of you who are parents, you have kids. You take the feedback of your emotions into account the same way that you would take the feedback of your staff into account. Okay, I hear what everybody here has to say. I'm gonna make the final decision. That's the exact thing that you do with your emotions. Our emotion, anger, 
sadness, uh, fear, even joy, happiness. And sometimes you can you know, do things that you probably shouldn't do when you're a little bit too excited. You recognize the emotion, accept that it's telling you something, appreciate it for its feedback, and then decide what you're going to do. This is the same thing you could do with any, anything, as a matter of fact. Somebody offers you some unsolicited advice that you really don't want to hear. All right, you can accept that they gave it to you. You can hear that they said it. You can register that you got the point and then do what you want to do anyway. All right, this is what you need to do with your emotions. Take them into account, and then you're the boss, and ultimately you make the final decision regardless of what everybody else had to say. Your emotions have input, but they're not the decision maker. There's a football coach, a legendary football coach from Florida State. His name is Bobby Bowden. He, I'm not sure if he's still alive. I think he's still alive, but he is no longer coaching. He retired several years ago, and he once told this story. Well, he didn't tell a story. What happened is, here's the story. There was a player on his team, a star player, who had gotten into some trouble off the field. And there was a big game coming up for the football team, and this guy got in trouble right, right before the game. And people were wondering, All right, what is Coach Bowden going to do? Is he going to suspend the player? Is he not going to let the player play in this big game? The team really needs this player for this big game. And the player ended up playing in the game. And when the game ended, the reporters, you know, they all got around Bobby Bowden, and they said, hey, why did you let that player play in the game? You know, he got in trouble, and no other players might get in trouble, and you might suspend them. But this player got in trouble. You let him play in the game. He said, oh, how'd you make, they asked him, how'd you make the decision, Coach Bowden? And Coach Bowden said, well, here's how I make decisions around here. I have nine assistant coaches on my staff. And anytime I had to make a decision, each one of my nine assistant coaches gets a vote. And I get 10 votes. That's the way you make decisions. Simple as that when it comes to your emotions. Point number two. Today's topic, again, the first half topic is how to respond and not react. Number two, time and space. This is the delta between the stimulus, which is the thing that happened, and the response, which is what you do in turn. The only difference between the response and the reaction is space, time and space. That's the only difference. A reaction, there's no time and space. Something happens, you immediately, there's immediately a, a comeback. So any of you, for example, who follows uh, combat sports, boxing, for example, a good boxer knows how to immediately react. The opponent throws a punch. That's when you're most vulnerable. They hit you back. So you watch, I was watching a, an old Floyd Mayweather fight yesterday, and he's a guy known for having very sharp reflexes, being extremely quick and very good in other aspects of the game as well. But one of the things about Floyd, if, as you go deeper into the rounds of a fight with him, Fighters get hesitant to even throw a punch at him because they understand every time they throw a punch, they're going to get hit because his timing and his reflexes are so great that as soon as you do something, he does something. So every time you throw a punch, even if, whether you land it or not, you're going to get punched in the face back because he's that quick. His reaction, those are reactions. That's not a response. That's a reaction. The difference between a response and a reaction is that just that there is time and space in between the two. Your aim most of the time is probably to respond, not react. Now, if you're playing a sport, now, if you happen to be boxing, you want to react. Uh, you don't want to take time and think about it in boxing. It'll be too late. By the time you think about it, you got punched in the face three more times. But in the rest of life, most of the time, you want to be responding, all right, not reacting. Now, although I hear your speaker here, I am an advocate of making errors of commission rather than errors of omission, which means it's better to do something and regret that than to do nothing and regret that. There is a commission that we that we do have when we react and not respond but the caveat is you don't want to get so focused on response that you get into you no know, paralysis by analysis where you're overthinking your response rather than moving yourself to take an action when you've already considered the situation and you know your options so once you know what needs to be done just do it so when i say put time and space between the stimulus and whatever it is that you do next that doesn't mean take a week to think about something that you already thought about Thinking happens relatively quickly. I want everybody who's listening to me right now, I want you to picture an elephant. An elephant, yes, this is not a trick. This is not a trick. All right, everybody knows what an elephant looks like, the big animal with the trunk that usually you see it in the, most of the time we see it in the zoo. I don't think there are any ele elephants in the wild in the United States. All right, everybody got a picture of an elephant in their mind? Okay, that's how fast thinking happens. All right, so when I told you picture an elephant and you pictured it, all right, that's how fast thinking happens. So, most of the time, you don't need to think that hard. But most of the time, when people say they need to think about it, what they're thinking about is either how they're going to do the thing they already decided that they want to do or how they're going to say no to the thing that they want to say no to, but maybe they just don't want to tell you no. So thinking happens relatively quickly. Thinking is instantaneous. So when I say a response, that does not mean you need to take 30 days to do something. 
All right, your thought process usually takes a lot less time than that, usually closer to 30 seconds. So that's where, when I say time and space, that's what I mean. So I'm making sure I'm putting that in there so nobody uses this as an excuse to uh, delay action. Point number three, we are talking here in this first half about how to respond and not react. Number three, control the situation. In moments of crisis, the leader is the whoever is the calmest person in the room, regardless of their status, their job title, or their credentials. Any of you who's ever been in the midst of a crisis situation, the leader who emerged in that situation was the person who was the calmest, most rational, and most even-keeled individual involved. It doesn't matter who they were. They could have been the lowest person on the, the totem pole in terms of company hierarchy or in terms of status relative to everybody in the room. But when people are in a crisis, none of that stuff matters, does it? All that matters is who's the calmest person in the room because that's the person everybody's going to follow and listen to. So when you get into reactive mode, which is what we do when we uh, maybe when you feel you're in a crisis, whether it's a real crisis or it's something that you just make up as a crisis in your mind. When you get into reactive mode during a crisis, what happens is the situation is controlling you because the thing that happened forced you to get into a certain state. That means you were controlled by the situation. You are letting the stimulus dictate what you do. When you are responding, on the other hand, you are controlling the situation. So something happened. This situation occurred, something that you were not expecting, something that maybe you didn't even want, as kind of surprises that you don't want. But and instead of you immediately going into reactive mode because something that you didn't want happened, you step back, you use time and space, and you control the situation. And then you start dictating to the stimulus rather than the stimulus dictating to you. So, for example, today when I get done with this, uh, when I get done with my segment, I need to go to the management office in my building because. There are some, for some reason, this is a, a unit that I moved into in this building. I was in a different unit, moved into this unit a month or so, about a month and a half ago. And for some reason, there keeps emerging ants in this unit. Ants. Right? There's no reason there should be ants in this building. Right? Based on how much I pay to live here, no way. There should be ants in here. So there's going to be a conversation that happens up there. Just a conversation. But I'm going to respond and not react in the situation. Now, when I first noticed this, I came home from the gym this morning and I saw uh, a whole bunch of ants walking around in certain parts of my home. And immediately my first thought was reactive, but there was nobody to react to. All I did was I got rid of the ants and now I have a chance to think about it and I'll be able to respond. I won't let the situation control me. I will be controlling the situation. So whenever you're in a situation where somebody, let's say you're at work or you're online or you're talking to a friend, somebody says something that you don't like. Or any of you ever been in that situation? Somebody says something that you did not like. You have options. You could, uh, as we say uh, in a euphemism, you could jump out the window. I don't mean literally jump out the window. It's a euphemism. It just means to react with a similar energy to theirs. So any of you ever been in that situation, put the number one in the chat when you were in some type of engagement, whether somebody just came out of nowhere or you were in a dialogue or maybe you were at work. It could have been anywhere. Somebody says something to you that you did not like and you jumped out the window. Any of you ever done that before? Put the number one in the chat. I will put a one in the chat because I have jumped out the window uh, many times. I, I was thinking about jumping out the window today, but there again, there was nobody to jump out the window at. So I was it was just going through my head. I didn't actually do anything. I just killed the ants. I guess I jumped out the window killing the ants. But any of you ever jumped out the window? I <laughs> put the number one in the chat. OK, so everybody in here has jumped out the window before. So. You could do that. And we all know that we have that option and maybe it felt good in the moment. But often uh, those of us who are, who are mature enough, we realize in the long run that all right, I, I probably didn't have to do it that way. You still could have got your point across. But if you would have took, put some time and space in between, you could have responded in a way that you still got your point across. But at the same time, you didn't allow the situation to control you. And this is really what I want you to think about, because maybe look, let's be honest, maybe it was satisfying. All right. Maybe you felt good about it. Put the number two in the chat. If you ever jumped out the window and you actually don't regret it, <laughs> you feel good. You're like, I'm glad I told that person because they needed to be told what they need to be told. They needed to be put in their place. They needed to be uh, cussed out. They needed to be checked. All right. Any of you ever jumped out the window and you actually are happy that you did. All right. So I'm getting a lot of twos. All right. So all right, y'all like me. All right. There are times I've jumped out the window and I don't regret it. But at the same time, we all understand that we could have still got the same point across, maybe not allowing the situation to control us with us controlling it 
a little bit more strongly again by simply putting some time and space in between what happened and what we did. And again, keep this in mind. This is the key point I want you to keep in mind about this. When something occurs that you were not expecting or that you don't want and you immediately go back and return the energy and kind, then that situation has basically dictated to you what you need to do. Powerful people never allow a situation to dictate to them. They always dictate to the situation. And this is the point that I want you to get. Doesn't mean you can't respond to what happened. All right. There are times in life when you do need to respond and sometimes you need to respond relatively quickly. But again, I'm just telling you to put some time and space and time and space does not mean five days. Time and space can mean 10 seconds. So any of you who does interviews, uh, any of you has a, any kind of a media where you interview people, one of the things that or just when you're having conversations with people, this is actually a conversational point that I heard a long time ago. I don't know who first came up with it. And I don't think anybody can get credit for it. But when you're talking to another person and they finish speaking, if you just take a breath and count to three after they get done speaking, two things happen. Number one is you actually get to process what they said if you are actually listening, not just waiting for your chance to speak. That's one thing that happens. And number two, if you're talking to another person and they're speaking and they get done, or at least it appears they're done, and you take a three count and a breath after they get done talking and there's that space right there, often here's what happens. They'll keep talking. <laughs> any of you ever had that happen? Any of you ever done this, been in that situation? Put the number three in the chat. That if any of you have ever tried this before, I, I may not be the only one who's ever heard of this, but you can all try this today. Next time you're in a conversation with somebody and they get done talking, or at least it appears that they're done talking, take a breath, keep looking at them and keep you no know, active listening. And just take a breath and count to three in your head. And what you will notice is often they will keep talking because they're not done. There's more that they will say if you will just let them talk. One of the things you'll notice about the world that we live in today is that everybody is broadcasting, right? So it, which means very few people are actually listening because everybody's talking. So if you would just give a little bit more time to anyone you're conversing with, they have more to say that they didn't even get finished saying yet. So start using that. Any of you can use that in conversation right now. And you can get to listen a lot more to other people and people will love you when you listen to them. They don't love you because of your eloquence. They love you because they get to talk and somebody actually is listening because these days, very few people listen. So the more powerful position is always respond. And that just means time and space in between what happens and what you do. All right, now, this position is difficult to occupy. I got to give you this part. It's difficult to occupy the power position in these situations because it's human nature sometimes to want to react, especially if somebody says or does something that really annoys you or really pisses you off or really crosses the line or you know, whatever it is. For or We all have our different things that, that we absolutely are not OK with. We all got our stuff. So it's very difficult to do. This is something that we can train ourselves to do. You have to be conscious about it. That's why we're talking about it. When you're conscious about it and intentional about it, now that this is at the front of your mind today, you can start training yourself to do this. And if you do it for long enough, it will become a habit to where you do it naturally. Right now, it may not come naturally to some of you if this is the, the first time it's occurred to you or maybe it's occurred to you before. You heard it before, but you haven't actually been doing it. So it will not come to you naturally if this is not something you normally do. But if you do it consistently, this can become a normal. This can become your normal mode of operation. So, for example, next time somebody says something crazy to you. Let's say in a text message or in an Internet comment or in an email. Those are places where you don't need to say something back immediately. Now, in a personal conversation, maybe a little bit different. That will take a little bit more effort. But in an email or a text message or Internet comment, you don't have to respond to it immediately. Just consider that next time somebody sends you an email and they say something crazy in that email, just mark it as unread and take some time to ponder what they said and how you would actually respond to it. Before you write back, you do not need to write back immediately as soon as they write you something, even if you want to. Because, again, if you do, they are controlling you instead of you controlling the situation. You control the circumstance. There was, I believe it was Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, I think it was Abraham Lincoln that once he had a, a general who I believe this was during uh, the Civil War that was doing a really bad job, at least in the eyes of Lincoln. He wasn't. You no, know, executing the way he was supposed to. Lincoln was getting really annoyed with this guy. So Lincoln, Lincoln, back then, we didn't have text messages or email. 
he wrote this guy a nasty letter, really nasty letter, and was really just going to put this guy in his place and tell him about himself, as we like to say. So Lincoln wrote this really nasty letter to this general, and he got done writing it, and he put it away in his desk drawer, and he never sent the letter. And the whole point for, I don't remember who told this story, but I remember reading it. The whole point was Lincoln got his energy out, whatever he was feeling about this general, but he didn't actually say it to him because he allowed some time and space. And as the time and space got in, Lincoln's energy, his reactive energy dissipated, and he didn't feel like putting that message out, what he, was, what he wrote in that letter to that general, and he never ended up, sending it, ended up getting rid of the letter and destroying it. Because when you give time and space to things, the, the boiling water of your reactive emotions usually calms down. You just got to give it a little bit of space. You recognize it, acknowledge it. Otherwise, it'll blow over. It'll explode on you. Recognize it and acknowledge it and then let it calm down. It will usually calm down on its own. It's kind of like you have some water boiling. You just take it off the heat. You don't have to do anything. It'll just stop boiling. Like it will slowly calm down. You leave it sitting there for long enough. Eventually, it'll be room temperature again. All right, just let it calm down. So when you control time, everybody... You are in a position of power. People in power control time. Now, let's recap this point. How to respond to this topic. How to respond and not react. Number one, emotional control. Remember that emotions cause reactions. All humans have emotions, so you have to be in the business of managing and controlling your emotions. Acknowledge them when they pop up, but do not allow them to tell you what to do. You tell them what to do. Number two, time and space. This is the delta between the stimulus and the response. And this is the only difference between a reaction and a response is that you put time and space in between the two. Understanding that as humans, we will always have times when we want to react. We will have times when we still react. But understand that if you just take some time, again, time can be 30 seconds. Time can be the time for you to take in a deep breath and let the breath out. Time can be counting to five in your head. That can be enough time for you to not react, but instead respond. And powerful people always respond, or at least they respond much more often than they react. And number three, control the situation. In moments of crisis, the leader is the calmest person in the room, regardless of their status, job title, or credentials. When we are reacting to whatever we consider to be a crisis, then the situation is controlling us. When we respond to a crisis, we are controlling the situation. Again, it could be the exact same thing that happened. We can take the time and space, think, relax, that, that the reason why we meditate, any of you who has a meditation or any kind of mindfulness practice, the reason that you do that is, and the reason why it's called a practice, you meditate for 30 minutes at the beginning of the day. Why? Not because you need to calm down during that 30 minutes. You meditate during 30 minutes at the beginning of the day so that you can go back to that practice during the other 23 hours and 30 minutes of the day. So when things get crazy, when you get out there into the world dealing with other people, the practice of meditation allows you to go to that space when you need to. That's the reason why it's called a practice. You practice now so that when you get in the game, metaphorically speaking, you can respond in the same way that you feel when you're in that meditative state. That's the reason why you practice these things. So the powerful position is to always allow time and space and to control the situation. You control the timing of how things go. You never allow the situation or other people to control your timing. So next time somebody sends you something nasty, in written format, a text message, an internet comment, or an email, don't immediately respond to it. Don't immediately react to it. Now, you might still say something back to them, but just don't do it immediately because they're probably waiting for you to say something. If you relax, calm down, control your emotions, take a deep breath, take some time and space, then you respond to them. You'll probably be a lot more thoughtful and you are controlling the situation rather than them controlling you. So with all that said, let's open up the floor for, for some discussion on this topic of Responding and not reacting, then we'll get to the professional development. Mike's hoping about, um, about 30 to 60 seconds per share. We'll take a couple and then we'll go to the other su sub subject. Mike's open. Hey, Trey, this is, uh, I've been out the window all weekend. Who's this? Cool. Hey, Shantae. Hey, Shantae. Good morning. <laughs> hey, good morning. You've been out the window all weekend? <laughs> I've been out the weekend. I'm telling you, this is divine. I needed to hear this message. So you're saying the pause, because see, I didn't talk about the pause. I right. Just I literally just went flat off. So I just I need another because like I know like I'm literally at the point where I know I'm about to go another round, so I need a real time tool for about an hour from now. Right. So is it the pause or is it just wait and not respond? Like I just I need a real time tool here. It can be both. It depends on the situation that you can Wait and not respond. That allows you to control the situation if you have the luxury of time, Shanta. I don't know if you do or you don't. Now if you I do. 
you do, if you have the luxury of time, take the time. Because I, what I find, and this is just a simple rule of thumb, uh, the more intelligent the person, the more time you take, usually the more measured your response and the better you can handle the situation so that you don't have to keep doing the back and forth. How does that sound? That sounds very practical. I can do that. Thank yeah, you. that's what you can do. And even if and when you end up in a situation, this is for everybody, you end up in a situation where you don't have the luxury of time. Let's say it's a face-to-face conversation. Again, take a breath. When they get done talking, breathe in, breathe out, count the three in your head, then say what you want to say. Just that alone will allow us to calm the emotion down and not become so reactive and, again, not jump out of windows. Thank you, Shantae. Who else has anything to share on this? Comment, question, anything? Good morning, Dre. It's Rhonda. Morning. Hey, Rhonda. So this is such a great conversation. You know, I just wanted to add a couple of other things. First of all, there's a physiology actually behind why sometimes we have that hair trigger in terms of our reaction, right? Because when that stimulus um, really enters into our brain, it goes through the emotional control center first. And so if we have not practiced and we do not have that discipline, very easy for the emotional control center to take hold of it and not want to let it get to your logical processing neocortex part. So I wanted to add that in. And then another thing that you can do when you're faced with these situations is to do two things. Number one, approach the situation with curiosity versus judgment, right? How dare they? Who do they think they are versus wonder what's really happening here, what, what's driving this? And then the second thing I use to get myself under control is empathy, extending it to others and myself. So I just wanted to add that. This is Rhonda. I'm on pause. Good stuff. Thank you, Rhonda. I appreciate that. Good stuff. I like the, um, that there's a physio- physiological aspect to it. And it's a really good uh, point to add there. So thank you. All right. Anyone else? We'll take one more and then we'll go into some professional development stuff. Sure. I like to add to that, especially... Um, Who's that talking? Who's this? This is this is Vashambi Brave. I'm down. Hey, Vashambi. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I really wanted to add that because I have a tool for you to use to be able to help with this. But first, everything doesn't warrant a response. So we also have That's to right. consider that, right? So we don't have to show up to every fight that we're invited to. And, and sometimes the best course of action is just to move forward. Um, and and not necessarily respond. But I will tell you a tool that helps me in my response, and it's along the lines of what uh, Rhonda was speaking on, and that's extending grace, right? So sometimes when we have negative reactions, particularly in the negative space, and someone has triggered us to want to be able just to react, if we can think to ourselves, you know, maybe what they've said or what they've done is in direct proportion to something that is going on with them. Maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they just found out that their, you know, their wife or husband has cancer. Maybe, you know, there's something that's happening. And if we can get into the practice of extending grace, it will help for us to give others, um, you know, the opportunity to, uh, you know, not always be at their best selves. And if we can think like that, that just allows us to operate at a higher level of emotional intelligence. And I really find that for me, this tool really helps me and how I show up in the world. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. And I appreciate your segment. This was amazing. Good stuff. Thank you. Grace and empathy. I like these, these words that you ladies have shared. I could use a little bit of both of those, probably a lot of both of those. So I appreciate y'all sharing that. There was someone else who was going to comment. We'll take that last one and then we'll go. Who was that? That was also commenting. I heard two voices. Hi, thank you. This is Travis Michelle. Happy hey, Travis. Monday, everyone. Good morning. I just wanted to share, you know, and with all of the tips, which were great, and I thank you so much, Dre, and everyone else who contributed. When they don't work because it's just wrong day, right person, right day, wrong person. Right. Forgive yourself. Give yourself some grace. You'll get an opportunity to do it better the next time. That's me, Trevor Michelle. Hey, ain't too much for some, not enough for others, but guess what? Always <laughs> just right for me. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I appreciate all you ladies for your comments there. And it's definitely a, I appreciate the uh, the female perspective on this. Is those words you all you all are using. You will not hear them in the work on your game world, but they are necessary. So I appreciate y'all sharing that. So let's pivot now to the uh, professional development side. I'm going to give you all two subjects here that you are going to vote on. Let's see what we got. So subject one will be the what we got here. 
Subject one is what it really takes to make money. That will be the M. I put the M for what it really takes to make money. And the other one is how to turn your side hustle into your main hustle. Put the S. So what it really takes to make money, put the letter M in the chat if that's what we should talk about in this next 25 minutes. Or if you want to talk about how to turn your side hustle into your main hustle, put the letter S for side hustle in the chat. So M for what did I say? What it really takes to make money. And S, I got so many topics here. I'm just looking through my list. S for how to turn your side hustle into your main hustle. So M is what it really takes to make money. S for a side hustle into main hustle. Let's see what we got. We got M, M, S, S, tied, still tied. M is winning. I'm going to give it like 15 more seconds. M is up by about two votes. Uh, who else wants to vote? Money, miss, what did I say? What it really takes to make money. What I keep messing that up. Right. What it really takes to make money is winning. S is coming in. M has the lead. And we're going to go five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So Juliet, CQ, and Daniel, y'all cast the deciding votes. We are going to go with M. What it really takes to make money. Let's pull this topic up and let's get to it. And we'll do the same thing that we just did. I'll discuss the topic, leave a few minutes at the end for some open discussion, and then we will be done. So many people think that many people think that it takes money to make money or that there is some complicated formula when it comes to making money. Now, it could be a complicated formula and you could use money to make money. So I'm not saying those are not necessarily true, but that's not the whole truth. It actually takes four specific things that you have heard of before in order to make money. And I'm going to share what they are here today. And the more you are able to accept, adapt and apply these four things that you know about. So these are uh, metaphorically speaking, everyday home, everyday things you have in your home that you will hear about today. The better you will be at making the money that you want to make. Again, these are not new things. These are not things that are um Excuse me. These are all available to every single one of you. You just need to plug into them. You need to become these two words that I use often conscious and intentional about using these. And you will find yourself getting more of what you want in life. You will find yourself winning more friends and influencing more people and getting more of the outcomes that you want, because all selling is, which is usually what we do in some form where we're trying to make money. All it is is your ability to persuade or influence people to do what you want them to do. That's all it is. So use these four attributes, which you already have. Some, just, some of us just have more than others, and some of us use them more than others. You can make the money you want to make. Number one, courage. Courage. Is anybody unfamiliar with the concept of courage? All, right, all of you are familiar with it, right? Definition of courage, the ability to do something that frightens one or strength in the face of pain or grief. Courage, number one thing you need to make money. If you read Robert G. Allen's book called Creating Wealth, if you have not read that book, I would suggest you go buy it. He talks about the four tangible assets, and his book was based around the concept. The, the frame that Robert G. Allen used in the book was about real estate. But even if you're not in real estate, you should read the book. I'm not in real estate, but I still read the book. And he's talked about assets. Anytime you're trying to acquire something, because Robert G. Allen's whole thing, his kind of claim to fame was that he would say, you could put me in any town, any place with no money, not knowing anybody, and within 48 hours, I will own a property free and clear with my name on the title. And that was his thing. And he you know, wrote a whole book about it. And there was a newspaper who took him up on the offer, put him in some town, not knowing anybody. And within 48 hours, he owned the property free and clear. And he talks about assets because a lot of people think, well, I can't get into X. I can't do this. I can't do that. Why? Because I don't have money. How many of you right now have something that you want to do that you are not doing because you don't have the money. Put the number four in the chat. Tell the truth. How many of you are not doing something right now? And the only reason you're not doing it is because you don't have the money. Like all other things, every other thing is great. Every other thing, all the other boxes are checked. The only reason you're not doing it is because you don't have the money. If you had the money, if somebody just dropped the money and a bag of money just landed in your lap right now, you will go do that thing right now. But you're not doing it because you don't have the money. Okay. So Robert G. Allen addresses this in his book called Creating Wealth. Now, I'll just mention it a second time. All right, go get that book. Here are the four tangible assets 
These are the things that if you go to the bank or you want a loan or you're trying to get some credit, these are the things that most people traditionally look for. Number one, cash. Number two, credit. Number three, owning some type of real property like a home. And number four, a steady paycheck. If you go to the bank and you ask for a loan, usually they're looking for one of those four things. You got any cash, you got any credit, do you have a home that you can put up as collateral, or, and do you have a steady paycheck, steady job? Those are the tangible assets that usually most of us think about when we're thinking about how do I go acquire anything. Now, there are four intangible assets. Here they are. Number one is courage. Just talked about that. Number two is knowledge, actually knowing stuff that other people don't know. Number three is relationships, knowing people who other people don't know. And number four is time, having time available to you. And you, if you really think about this, you can trade any of these four things for anything that you want. If any of you has ever, I remember I worked at, you know, my first ever job was at Pizza Hut. And I was working at the counter, just taking orders. I was trading my time for what? Cash. I got paid five fifteen an hour. So every hour I worked, I made $5. I was trading an intangible asset for a tangible asset. When you have relationships, how many of you have ever gotten an opportunity and was able to do some business, not necessarily because you were the best candidate, but because you knew the right person? Put the number five in the chat. Any of you have ever done any business? Any of you have ever consummated a business deal, got a job, got an opportunity, uh, got a client, landed a speaking gig just because you knew the right person? Not necessarily because you were so great. Now, I mean, I'm not saying you're not great. But how many of you ever did some businesses based on a relationship? Put the number five in the chat. Okay, all of you. Any of you who's been in business, you've done business based on a relationship. Now, you might not be thinking about it, but that's often why we do business. We do business based on relationships. And we are in a collaboration era, so you should be doing business based on relationships as much as possible, not based on skill. Very hard to prove skill. is A relationship is easy to uh, utilize. Let's put it that way. What was the other one I said? Information. How many information marketers we have in the room? Put the number six in the chat. If you sell information, if you are in the coaching space, if you have ever written a book, if you have ever had a coaching client, if you have ever sold someone a service, not a hard product, but an actual service, doesn't matter what it is. If you're an auto mechanic, you are selling information. Why? Because you know how to fix the car and your customer does not know how to fix the car. So your knowledge is what they're paying for. How many of you are in the information space? Put the number six in the chat. Number six in the chat, you're in the information space. Okay, so see a bunch of you. So I just proved to everybody in the room that time, knowledge, and relationships can be traded for tangible assets. Cash, credit, property. Well, if you have cash, you usually can get credit. If you have cash, you usually get some property. And if you want a steady paycheck, you can get one. All you have to do is use your intangible assets. We just have to think about them as they are. And this is the other one. The fourth one is courage. Okay, this is my first point, courage. Courage is your willingness to take risks and try things that other people may not be willing to try. Why? Because that makes you relatively more valuable than everybody else. The more courage you have, the more value you can create simply because there are fewer people who are willing to do what you are willing to do. When you're willing to do something and nobody else in the room is willing to do, you become a valuable individual as long as you can sell the value of that thing that you're willing to do that they're not. Simple as that. Remember what the definition of an entrepreneur is. It is a person who runs a business enterprise while taking on greater than normal financial risk. That's the definition of an entrepreneur. So your willingness to be courageous is an asset in business. As a matter of fact, you had to be courageous in order to even get in business in the first place. Now, if you're not willing to be courageous, you're not willing to take on financial risk. You can't be in business and the financial risk of being an entrepreneur, even if you don't put up money to start your business, which these days, oftentimes you don't have to. The fact that you are out there doing your thing, selling your knowledge, selling your information, uh, milking your relationships to do business with no safety net. Those of you who are full time entrepreneurs, that's a risk in itself, is it not? So that is uh, the courage part. So that's number one. Number two, we we're talking what it really takes to make money. Number two is action. Everybody familiar with action? I'm asking you these questions because I'm reminding you all that these are not things that are new to you. Action is the fact or process of doing something typically to achieve an aim. Most of you are familiar with action. All right? We take action every day. Now, I talk over here at Work On Your Game. We talk about action bias, which is a person being more inclined to go do something than just sit around and think about something, plan it, hem and haul, and consider. All right. And I have this framework called the 12 Work On Your Game Commandments. It's actually 13, but it's, we call it the 12. And I got a specific episode on my podcast where I talk about action bias. The whole point is... You want to make money, you got to be active in the marketplace. 
Now, you want to make money, you have to be active in the marketplace, you have to be findable. People have to know that you exist. How simple as that. I was I saw this guy, he was telling the story about how he and a business colleague of his, they both were uh, looking at their social medias and how much response they were getting on social media. And one guy was saying to the other guy, person A was saying to person B, hey, man, I'm not getting that much. No, I did. I posted more on social media this month. I posted like 50 percent more on social media than I did the previous month. But I didn't get that much more engagement. And he asked person B, how did you do? He said, well, man, I got like 10 times more engagement on social media. What was the difference between the two of them? Person B said, instead of doing 50 percent more, we did 50 times more. We just we just basically 50 X our output on social media and therefore we got a lot more engagement. It wasn't because person B's content was better or he's a better speaker or he had better editing or any of that nonsense that a lot of people get into the weeds in when it comes to doing more of their thing. It's they just upped their output. They upped their activity. They upped their action. If you want to make money, you have to take action. You have to be seen, heard and known. And understand the strength of any economy, whether we're talking the governmental, national economy, or your personal economy, is based on what? The circulation of money. When no money is circulating, we call that a depression or a recession. When money is circulating, we have a healthy economy. Everybody's making money. As I go spend money with this, I go spend money at the, for the gym. I go pay for the gym. The gym takes that money and they go buy equipment. The equipment person who sold them that takes that money and they go hire staff. The staff gets the job. They make money and they go and they go buy some books from you know, workonyourgame.com. They go get the third day, which is the link that I have at the top of the screen right here. And then I got the money. Now what do I do? I circulate that money right back by paying the gym next month. That is a healthy economy. When nobody's spending any money, there's no activity happening, then everything falls apart and everybody's in a bad space. So what you need to do is get more circulation going in your world through activity and that leads to the opportunity for you to make more money. So that means you got to be out there. If nobody's knocking on your door, then you start knocking on doors. Nobody's ringing your phone. You start ringing phones. Nobody's lighting up your inbox. You start lighting up inboxes. When you are making people aware of what you offer and the value you can provide to them, assuming that you are actually good, you will create more opportunities for yourself, more swings at the more swings at bat or right? more chances you give yourself at bat better chance you'll eventually hit something and make something happen, even if you're not that good. Number three, we are talking here today of what it really takes to make money. Number three is creativity. Again, let me ask the question. Is anyone unfamiliar with the concept of creativity? Creativity is the use of imagination or original ideas, especially in the production of an artistic work. Everybody here is familiar with creativity. When you don't have the money to make things happen, and you feel like money is the only thing that is the difference between you making it happen and not making it happen, then you're telling yourself a lie because what you really need is not money. What you need is creativity. What you need is another way of looking at the situation. When you get creative, you can find another way to make it happen. Any of you who put, when I ask how many of you have something that you want to do, but you just don't have the money to make it happen, you put the number four in the chat. Here's what I'll offer to you. Next time you're in that situation, or let's say that same situation exists, it's something you want to do, it's there, but you can't do it because you don't have the money, go to whoever is offering it or selling it or whatever the deal is, whoever, whoever, whatever it is, and you don't have the money, and say to them, look, I want to do this, I want to buy this, I want to get involved in this, I want to join, whatever, but I don't have whatever the amount of money is. I don't have $100 right now, I have $1,000 right now, I have $20,000 right now. What other options are there for us making this work? Just ask that question. Ask them the question. What other options are there for us making this work? If you just ask that question, you will be surprised at what answers you might get. What other options are there for us making this work? Maybe they have a payment plan. Maybe they have some kind of you no know, scholarship or credit and they have a deferred plan or something like that. Maybe you can barter. You can offer something else. So you don't have money, but you have something else that they want that could possibly be used. So ask the question and you'd be surprised at the answer. Now, maybe, let me be clear, sometimes somebody will say, well, if you don't have the money, we can't do anything. Maybe you'll get that answer. But if you ask this question on a consistent basis, anytime you find yourself short of money and you think money is the only difference between where you are and where you want to be, just ask this question to whoever you're dealing with. And again, they might be more creative than you are. Or they might come up with a creative idea or they may say to you, well, 
well, we really want the twenty thousand dollars, but hey, if you got a creative idea for how you can make up for you can make up the difference of what you don't have in cash, let us know what it is and we're open to it. Let's see what you got. All right, if you don't have money, folks, have creativity. If if you don't have creativity, you got chat GPT. All right, they're creative. All right, ask them a question, let them answer. All right, be creative. Think of other ways. There's always another way to make anything happen. The only thing that we run out of is uh, creative ideas. This is why I have the practice of coming up with 10 ideas a day, even if they all suck. Why? Because I'm exercising the idea muscle. So if and when I need an idea, I can call on my brain to come up with one because it's ready. It's in shape. All right. So if you're an entrepreneur, you want to be you want to have this creative muscle working. Many of you are very creative entrepreneurs. This is why we have a lot of entrepreneurs who are who lean more towards being artists than being business people because we're creative. We're always coming up with new ideas. So come up with a creative way to provide value for something for someone rather that they see as valuable, that you see as valuable and you're able to communicate to them why it's valuable. And boom, there's a creativity right there. So if you look at your own business, any of you who has a, a, a business, whether it's on the side or full time, look at your products, look at your services, whatever it is that you sell, you created that. Right? You came up with that out of nothing. Right. Or maybe you borrowed somebody else's idea, but you created your own version of it and you solved somebody's problem. That's exactly what people pay for. So the more creative you can be, the more options you give yourself. Every time you can come up with something creative, you're giving yourself another option of making it happen. You want to give yourself as many options as possible. Now, the caveat to this is you want to be careful with creativity because you may get caught up in being creative and not focus on the main point, which is actually you know, making the exchange. The exchange is getting the actual outcome. So don't get so deep in creativity, you forget about the goal, which is the outcome. And point number four, we are talking here today about what it really takes to make money. Number four is persistence. Again, is anybody unfamiliar with the concept of persistence? Persistence is firm or obstinate continuance in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. This right here, and some people could call this uh, stick to itiveness. Some people call it uh, determination. This is a, a sub, sub, sub subject of mental toughness. This right here is the biggest difference between the successes and the failures, assuming that people have a baseline level of skill. Persistence. Persistence will serve you in any aspect of life and making money is no exception. How often and how much are you willing to follow up with anyone who doesn't take the action that you want to take? Any of you who sells things online, do you have a follow up process, an automated follow up process or a manual follow up process? Put the number six in the chat if you have a follow up process for anything that you sell. Somebody comes through one of your sales funnels and they don't buy. You have a process for following up with them to give them another chance and another chance to buy. That link that I have at the top of the screen, thirddaybook.com. You go to that funnel and you put your information in, but you do not complete the order to order that book. Oh, we're going to be in your inbox. <laughs> Within 30 minutes, I'm going to be in your inbox and we're going to follow up with you. We're going to keep following up with you. And when it comes to the Dream 100, that's how I land you no know, media appearances and things like that. I tell my staff all the time as they ask, you know, how do we follow up? When I reach out to a show, let's say I want to be on somebody's podcast and we reach out to them, our follow-up process is at least eight emails. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight emails we will send without getting a single response. If they don't respond, we wait about six months and then we start the whole process all over again. The whole point is, to paraphrase what uh, Leonardo DiCaprio said in The Wolf of Wall Street, any of you saw that uh, movie, we continue to follow up until they buy or they die or we die, whichever one happens first. Continuous follow up persistence. All right. So anytime you have people in your world who want to do something, but they're hesitant to take action, your job as a salesperson, your job as a leader is to guide them and get them to take the action that they know they want to take, but they don't have the courage to take. You provide them the courage. Understand the definition of a client. Any of you who does client work, definition of a client is a person who is under the care of whoever the practitioner is. So any of you who's a coach, any of you who's a consultant, your clients are people who are under your care. They need you to provide them the courage and the strength and the confidence that they don't have. Because if they had it, well, guess what? They would be getting their own clients. All right? They need you to help them get them to where they want to go. You got to provide them what they are missing. All right? That's why they're coming to you in the first place. That is your job. That is your duty, is your moral obligation as a salesperson. So they need to take action. They don't have the requisite courage. You give it to them. All right? you, sometimes you got to tell them what to do. 
Sometimes you got to tell them, hey, take out your credit card. Sometimes you got to tell them, hey, go uh, apply for this credit card. Go get your husband on the phone if we need to so we can get this done. It's not your responsibility to make people good, but if you want to help people, often you have to move them to action that they would otherwise be unwilling to take on their own volition. So if they would take it on their own volition, they probably wouldn't need you in the first place. All right, this is where your persistence and ability to persuade and influence kicks in. This is your job as a sales person. Right, it is so... People have been in one frame of mind for so long that it's your job to get them into a different frame. And the better you are at doing that, the better the world will pay you. So all that said, let me recap these four points quickly and then we'll open up for some discussion. We got four minutes here. What it really takes to make money. Number one, courage. All right. Robert G. Allen talked about this in Creating Wealth. The four intangible assets, courage, time, relationships and knowledge. Number two, action. Get out there and get active. You want your personal economy to do better, then how does the economy work? It needs circulation. The more circulation going on in the economy, the healthier the economy is. So that is one way that you can copy the governmental economy. I'm not saying copy all of it. They got some other things going on, but that part is right. Number three, creativity. You are already creative. You're an entrepreneur. You created a whole bunch of things. You're on social media. You create every single day. Get creative when it comes to how you're generating money and giving yourself options to generate it. And number four, persistence. This is the difference between all other things being equal skill wise, relatively. Persistence is the difference between the winners and the losers. Who is willing to persist longest and stay in the game the longest? Are you a sprinter or a marathon runner? All that said, Mike's open. Let's have some conversation about what it really takes to make money. Who's that? Hey, uh, Dre, it's Shantae, really quick. Hey, Shantae. I got your book as a result of how good your system is, the follow up system. Because when there I was trying, I was at work and I couldn't complete the purchase. And it just really set off an alarm like, wow were able to do that because he had a follow-up system so that way I was able to do it on my break on my phone but I need to do that for my business so I'm grateful that I benefited from you having a follow-up system thanks excellent now we got to follow up and sell you the next book so that's the that's the next success story you want to hear Shantae so I appreciate that all right who else has uh who else got something they want to share here on the subject what it really takes to make money courage action creativity persistence mic is open Okay, so everybody's shy and quiet now. All right, so while I'm waiting for somebody to speak up, uh, my book, The Third Day, that Shantae just mentioned, is the link at the top there, thirddaybook.com. The book is free. All you're going to do is cover the shipping, and we will ship it to you worldwide, wherever you happen to live. And that is a funnel, so we're going to offer you more than one book. Now, who reads just one book anyway? So you might as well just say yes on the next page and the next page. You can leave that funnel with 11 books, not just one. Uh, the mic's open, though. I'm waiting. Anybody just interrupt me here while I'm, while I'm talking. We are talking about what it really takes to make money and also my daily motivation text message. I send it out for free every morning. Anybody like to receive that message guaranteed to have you focused, sharp and on point to start your day. Just text me at my number 305-384-6894. It is down below in the, uh, well, it's in the comment section. I'll put it in there one more time so you don't have to scroll and look for it. Anyone have anything to add or ask or share around this subject of what it really takes to make money? Hopefully gave you all some uh, different ways of looking at it so that you don't feel stuck. Like I don't have this, so I can't do anything. That's the place. That's the last place that you want to be. You want to be mentally circulating. How did you get started, Dre, with the follow-up system? Like for those who may be small business owners, like the, I know you have an elaborate follow-up. Mm -hmm. But are there simple things we could do to just get started with an automated um, follow-up system? Yes, the simplest thing you can do. Who was that asking that question? Who was it? Shantae. Oh, Shantae. Simplest thing you can do is plug into somebody who already knows exactly how and why to do it and then just listen to what they say and do what they tell you to do, which is how I got mine. <laughs> so I got mine from, what'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I got mine from, uh, I use a, a system called ClickFunnels. I use that app for my all my sales funnels through ClickFunnels. There's a guy there named Russell Brunson. He explained it. He got it from a guy named Dan Kennedy, who's an old marketing guy. He was marketing like back before the internet was out. And I'm in Dan Kennedy's, um, one of his masterminds. I've been to Russell's event every year. They have an event called Funnel Hacking Live. It's in Orlando in September. I will be at Funnel Hacking Live. So any of you who wants to learn uh, online marketing, Russell Brunson is the guy. And this is not an affiliate, and I don't get paid if you come to the event, but I would suggest any of you on online marketing come to Funnel Hacking Live. So thank you for that question, Shanta. We are right at 9 o'clock on the dot, everybody. I appreciate your time and attention here. I'm here every Monday from 8 to 9. 
a.m. Eastern until further notice. And I'm passing the mic to Angeline. Good morning. Angeline, you're on mute if you're talking. And while we wait for her to... Good morning. Good morning. Yes, Dre, thank you so much for that. I apologize about the delay there. I was trying to get to the mute button. <laughs> welcome, welcome, champions. Oh my gosh. Daily motivation text, Monday everybody. Monday morning, you are in the Breakfast with Champions Put that number in here for those of you who don't one get it. One-stop shop for motivation, education, inspiration. Give it up for Dre Baldwin, always a drop in the fire, always reminding us of all the things the only motivation text right there, get it every single day free of charge, straight to your phone, hit me in the DM, or text me any questions, anything like that. Oh, that number is in my profile as well. Work on your name, you got it. 